Hi, welcome to Oxford Vineyard and to our Sunday gathering. I'm Andrew, Mandy and I lead this church and we're delighted to be able to welcome you today. Today we're going to have two TED Talks. John T's doing the first one and then I'll do the second. And after that we'll head over to Zoom for worship, for a chance to ask the Holy Spirit to come and minister to us and then to go into breakout rooms where we can, if we want to, pray for each other some more or just chat and uh, build a bit of relationship. So I really hope you'll come and join us with that. The link for Zoom will be in the chat box and it's also on the website. So please do come and join us. Even if you're here for the first time, we would love to meet you. We'd love to get to know you a bit. Good morning, everyone. It's an exciting time with lockdown starting to loosen. I'm not sure what you're looking forward to to the most, but for me, it's going to a swimming pool, meeting up with friends and family and getting a long overdue haircut. It feels like we're coming into a new season and indeed we are. And the question I want to encourage us to think about today is what does God have, have for us, his church, in these coming months? Where can we partner with God and what can we build together? So the purpose of my talk today is to encourage us to dream and encourage us to go for it when opportunities arise. And we're going to be taking a look at the book of Nehemiah as we do. So who was Nehemiah and how is he relevant? His story is recorded in the Old Testament. It's set after the exile of the Jewish people to Babylon. He had a secular but influential job working as cupbearer to the king of Persia. And during this time, his brother told him about the suffering of the people in Jerusalem and the state of the city. So he asked for permission to go to Jerusalem. And when he did, he brought the people together to rebuild the walls. And he also introduced a number of other reforms. And I think we can learn from how Nehemiah made himself available to God, allowed his heart to be broken, worked in partnership with others, um, didn't allow himself to be intimidated and how he saw the favour of God on his life. So point one, let's make ourselves available and aware of God's leading in our lives. There is plenty of work for us to do. As Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Let's look at how God gripped Nehemiah's heart. In Nehemiah 1 verses 3 to 4, uh, this it reads, um, and this is when Nehemiah hears the report of what's happening in Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burnt with fire. And then Nehemiah uh, 1 verses 8 to 9, uh, this is how it records how Nehemiah responds in prayer. Remember the instruction you gave to your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to a place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Yeah, so I think these um, two passages show us a number of ways that we can identify what God is calling us to. What breaks our hearts? In Nehemiah's case, it was the state of Jerusalem. Where has God placed us? For Nehemiah, it was in a position of influence with the king of Persia. For us, we may be placed in our church, in our jobs and in our communities. What does God promise? Uh, in this case, if you return to me, I will gather you. And what skills has God given us? Not touched. It's not touched on here, but Nehemiah um, was evidently a very skilled leader. And we know that God has given us each talents and that we'll be rewarded for using them as it is in the parable of talents. Point two, let's build together. Across the city where I went to university, hundreds of Christians were living in what was dubbed intentional communities. There were groups of people living in shared accommodation, doing life together and pursuing Jesus together. This appealed to me as a student uh, and I found a group uh, of other students that I barely knew but wanted the same thing and we moved in together. Um, I learned infinitely, this, well this became a very um, 
formative time for me and I learned infinitely more about myself and about God than if I was doing things solo. In particular, I um, learned how important relationships are in overcoming challenges. I was facing an, a number at the time. Um, for example, I was having doubts about my faith uh, and how important relationships are in shaping our identity. The task of rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem was massive. There's a long list of people involved, many doing a chunk of wall near their home, but they did it in only 52 days. The only way that they could do this was by working as one. And we're told that the people worked with all their heart in Nehemiah 4 verse 6. And this became even more vital due to the threats that they faced. Uh, they were yeah, under threats of attack. Um, but So they were working separate, but ready to get joined together at the trumpet call. We are designed to work as one body. It's part of God's beautiful plan. And from 1 Corinthians 12, the body is a unit, though it is composed of many parts. And although its parts are many, they all form one body. So it is with Christ. And in John 13, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Yeah. Point three, let's take the risks that we need to. One of the remarkable things about the story of Nehemiah is the level of persecution they received. It made the surrounding people angry to see the walls of Jerusalem being rebuilt. They had a lot of accusations coming that way, coming their way. They were repeatedly accused of rebelling against the king. They were ridiculed and mocked. Um, such things like, what are these feeble Jews doing? And also, even a fox climbing up on your walls would make them break down. Uh, these then turned into threats. Um, they, people were saying, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to their work. They even had false prophets pay, prayed to prophesy against them. And in this, they turned to God and God frustrated the plans of their enemies. Uh, they also demonstrated wisdom in how they acted. Um, yeah, supporting each other. One of the most common commandments in the Bible is to not be afraid. I think I saw that from Andrew. And this is exactly Nehemiah's exhortation to the people. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and daughters, your wives and homes. Nehemiah acted again and again in the face of fear. Not that he didn't admit to it, he did. And he encouraged others to do likewise. Yeah, so um, that's all from me together. Sorry, today. Um, but just to recap those three points, point one, let's make ourselves available to God and aware of his leading in our lives. Point two, let's build together. And point three, let's take the risks that we need to. Thank you very much and see you soon. Several people have asked me about this poster on the wall behind me. Uh, one person just before Christmas asked if it was a revival advent calendar. What a brilliant idea. Uh, maybe that's a new business idea for, for somebody to pursue. But I thought it might be helpful just to look at it today to get a bit of a glimpse of what God has done over the centuries. It starts with the Reformation in the early 1500s, and although we know that there were revivals before that in many different places. One encouraging thing to see is how the amount of revivals and the work of the Holy Spirit that we can see visibly has increased dramatically up until the present time. Let's look at a few of the highlights, shall we? The early 1500s, we have the Reformation. And in fact, even the Reformation should start a couple of hundred years earlier than the timeline shows us. John Wycliffe, who translated the first Bible from Latin into English in 1382, did it here in Oxford, is called the Morning Star of the Reformation. And what he started, what God started through him, uh, continued. 
The medieval church, the Catholic church at that time, had descended into something that was almost unrecognisable as a Christian church. It was full of politics and corruption, having left many biblical teachings behind and invented some non-biblical teachings of their own. The church and society was desperately in need of something new. And that was what built from the time of Wycliffe through to the early 1500s. In 1525, William Tyndale published the first Bible that was a translation into English from the original Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek. And this was seen as such a threat both politically and by the church authorities, which were very intermixed at the time, that what he did carried the death penalty. So what he started here in Oxford, starting his translation of the Bible, ended with his arrest and murder in 1536. But the impact of what he did, making the Bible available to everybody rather than just a few scholars, together with more known, well-known people such as Martin Luther, completely changed not only the church but also changed society by drawing people to Jesus. But eventually, although that revival was wonderful, it began to wane. And so the next one we're going to pick up is the First Great Awakening, so-called. What's known as the First Great Awakening impacted the United Kingdom, Europe and the United States. Some of the key people are John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield, who started what they were doing here in Oxford and went on to lead a revival that completely changed society. Many people have said that if it wasn't for the first great, great awakening, the United Kingdom would have followed France into revolution. Revolution or reformation, revival, take your pick. Undergirding the revival, this revival, the First Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening, which came about 50 years later, was intercession. The Moravians in Germany started a 24-hour prayer uh, intercession movement, which lasted from 1727 for 100 years, covering both those revivals. The 1859 revival after another lull, there were further revivals in around 1859 and uh, in many different places as well. But again, one of the main features of this revival was intercession. A couple of years earlier, in 1857, people started gathering in a Dutch Reformed church in New York, in Fulton Street. They started praying at 12 o'clock on a Wednesday for an hour. Uh, just six people gathered the first time. Next week it doubled. And then they started, as numbers increased, to pray daily. And then other churches got involved and it spread. By 1859, over 10,000 people were praying. And as you would expect, as a result of that, the number of people coming to faith in Jesus increased. In the two-year period between October 1857 and September 1859, over a million people in the United States came to faith in Jesus. That was when the total population was about 30 million. But similar things were happening elsewhere. In Northern Ireland, 3,000 people gathered as uh, the result of the healing of a woman. It spread from that meeting place to Belfast and then down to the south of Ireland as well. In uh, the island of Ireland, over 100,000 converts. It then jumped across uh, to Glasgow and then spread to the whole of Scotland. 300,000 converts in Scotland. After the 1859 revival, the fire began to jump from place to place. And so, for example, in, in Wales, there was a revival about every 30 years. 
in the 19th century. But again, by 1904, things had begun to get very quiet again. Evan Roberts, a young, inexperienced Bible student, sent out a challenge for revival and started preaching. Within two months, 32,000 people had come to faith in Jesus. And although the 1904 revival only lasted a couple of years, probably because it appeared to have been mishandled, it had a huge impact on the whole of Wales. It then jumped across the pond, and in 1906, we have the start of the Pentecostal movement in a Sousa Street in Los Angeles. And the growth of the Pentecostal movement worldwide has been phenomenal since then. The Pentecostal movement has been described as the first wave of the Holy Spirit in the last century. It largely resulted in new churches being formed and didn't really have much impact upon the established church. However, that changed. And in the 1960s, 1970s, we have the charismatic renewal, or what was known as the Jesus People Movement in the United States. And that was the second wave of the Holy Spirit. And uh, that second wave had a huge impact on many denominations, established denominations. And so uh, in 1974, I was baptised in the Holy Spirit in uh, the Anglican church that my dad was leading. And then that developed into the third wave of the Holy Spirit, which was spearheaded by John Wimber and the Vineyard Churches. When John died, it was said that he had had more impact on the church in the West than any other person since John Wesley. That was back in the 1700s. So, and that's quite a statement, but I believe it's true. But it's not limited to one place and one people group. It's, it's happening all over the world. <clears throat> As we look around the world today, we see incredible things happening uh, in all sorts of different places. One person I know was working uh, with just three people and within a couple of years, he had over 300 groups of new believers spread across the country. In Iran, we see the fastest growing evangelical church in the world, all of it underground, all of it facing incredible persecution. When we look back at that timeline and we look at the right hand side, there's a lot happening. But there's still a lot more to be done. Although we see huge numbers of people coming to faith in Jesus, the percentage of the world population who follow Jesus has remained the same for decades, at about 33%. Here in England, it's a shabby 6%. We should be hugely encouraged by what God has done in the past and is doing. And often when it's when times look their most bleak, their most dark, that revival came. I believe that God wants to do the same thing here for us. Jesus said to his followers, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now go. And remember that I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. You'll find that in the Bible in Luke chapter 10 verses 2 and 3. If we want to see revival come and the darkness that surrounds us driven back with people being set free from the power of darkness and saved for eternity, we need to respond to what Jesus said in these verses. And the first thing he says there is to pray. We know that intercession is powerful. We see that in revival. In our church, we've seen some lovely answers to prayer just recently with uh, people who've been very ill getting well again. And <clears throat> we know that we can pray on our own. We can intercede on our own. We can also pray with other people. There hasn't been a time in history when it has been easier for people to pray together because of the internet. We know there are different kinds of prayer. There's 
intercession. Then there's the prayer of authority that we use when we're ministering to the sick and the demonized. So we're called to pray. We're also called to pray for workers in the harvest. That's the second thing. Jesus said that there, there is already a harvest out there. We just need more people out there to bring the harvest in. So pray for more workers and pray for the workers who are already out there. That We just need to take the call seriously and we'll find that as we pray, Jesus says you're the answer to your prayers as well. And the third thing, therefore, is to respond to the call of Jesus. He's calling us to be workers in his harvest field. Revival doesn't just happen. It happens when we respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing. It's clear to me that God did not cause COVID, nor did he uh, cause the necessity of lockdown. But he can use anything, even the worst things, and he wants to reset the church. There are things that he wants us to learn. There are things that need to change. And we'll talk more about that another time. But today, just two things for you to help you in this process. First thing, be encouraged. Be encouraged by what God has done in the past. Be encouraged by what God is doing around the world and be filled with faith for what God wants to do in the future through us here in the Oxford area or wherever you happen to be. And then the second thing, pray for workers in the harvest. Intercession is powerful. It's the engine room of the church and we need to really take that seriously. So let's head over to Zoom now. We're going to worship Jesus. He is always worthy of our worship. And then we'll have a time for the Holy Spirit to come and minister to us as we wait on him before we then uh, have some time chatting to each other. I hope you'll come and join us.